My name is Jamie Staley, and I'm the Director of Christian Education at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. For those of you who I don't know, I see some names on our attendee list that I don't necessarily recognize. Um, I'm really excited to have you all with me this evening, um, and I'm super excited to welcome Dr. Randall Jelks uh, this evening. Our programming for this summer has been um, very slow, and so I'm really excited that we're able to offer a webinar which we haven't done in the past in the summer. So um, Dr. Jelks is the professor of African and African American Studies and American Studies at the University of Kansas. And he's a colleague of Fifth Avenue's Pastor Emeritus, Reverend Dr. J. Oscar McLeod, who I know many of you know. Dr. Jelks uh, has written a series of meditations, which I've got here, Letters to Martin, that speak specifically to issues of, I realize this is backwards, of economic equality, freedom of assembly, and police brutality. Um, we're really excited to have him share uh, this evening with us about this book, about his process, and about um, where this came from. So welcome, Dr. Jelks. I'm so thank excited you. to hear from you this evening. Thank you so, so very much, Jamie. And thank you to Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church for uh, hosting me and and hosting this book, I am eternally grateful uh, to, to you all and to all the people in the seminar. Uh, so I wanna begin with saying that this uh, book uh, came out of uh, my concerns for uh, uh, community. Um, uh, uh, being an academician, sometimes we're highbrow and way out there. And I increasingly grew concerned that uh, democracy itself was under uh, threat and uh, the way we think about democracy. And so I had to figure out a creative way um, to, uh, uh, to, to talk about the subject. And I hit upon the idea, stealing from various uh, novelist friends. Um, uh, I have a, a friend, uh, Ms. Uh, Tyree Jones, who wrote a, in, a wonderful book called American Marriage. And, uh, and it was in the form of a series of letters. Of course, we know about Alice Walker, The Color Purple, and many other ways. And of course, in the great Christian tradition, Paul's uh, letters, uh, 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 epistles uh, that we share in, in churches and that were passed around uh, various congregations in the ancient world. Um, and finally, we also know of uh, uh, Dr. King's own letters to a Birmingham jail. So I said, okay, why don't I, I write these letters uh, to Dr. King? Um, and, um, and knowing that I was not going to get a response, but to uh, help us to uh, meditate. And the word meditation really means to take a step back, uh, to take a breath, and to uh, uh, gain perspective. And so what I was trying to do is to add a perspective. And I specifically wanted to add this perspective of, uh, of an African-American voice uh, uh, around the subject of democracy. Uh, there, there were other books written about it, but I thought that this is a way to uh, gain uh, attention to uh, uh, of a lot of people is to, to write this series of letters uh, to Martin uh, using his first name uh, as a, a more intimate way of thinking about uh, our current issues uh, that lie before us. So, so my, my goal was to, to write something that would uh, move the heart. Um, in academics, we often try to convince people of the uh, rationality of things. So it, the kind of social scientific approach. And while those have many truths in it, uh, they don't move the heart. And most people are engaged uh, in whatever side of a social issue is because they feel compelled by the heart. And so I wanted to find something that uh, move uh, the heart. And if I could say it from a personal perspective, that, that's what I wanted. Uh, attempted to do um, and to, to challenge us to think about and to have discussions with one another. 
letters are things that you, when you write, you know, friends write you, and not pe too many people write each other in, anymore. But when a friend writes you, you have to take time to um, and choose your words carefully uh, and to think through what you're trying to say uh, as you put pen to paper. Um, now we type up emails, quick responses, we tweet, we do, we Facebook, but we don't take the time to actually uh, fully express our views uh, as best we can in a letter. And I thought those, that form was really, really important to do because life has become like sports television. And I love sports television. Um, we can yell at each other on sports television, but I don't think it's good that we do it all the time. I think it's good that we exchange viewpoints, that we give each other dignity to exchange viewpoints and to understand where one another is coming from. And so this, these letters were a way for me to, to reach out to a public uh, in, in a different way. And lastly, I'll say that um, I grew up, you'll see my background, I grew up in the city of New Orleans and uh, I was 11 years old. I'm dating myself now when um, uh, Dr. King was assassinated. Uh, and it, it was uh, the, my way of engaging um, the world around me uh, when that assassination ha happened, that I needed to know more about not just the United States, but the world around me and, and that, 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 surrounds, uh, that surrounds us all, all together. Because I too believe we're caught in a network of mutuality. Um, you know, what is happening in Ukraine uh, it creates a food, food crisis all over the world. Uh, what's, uh, what, what's hap what happens in Eastern Congo, most people don't even know about the region of Eastern Congo where most cobalt is uh, dug out of the ground so you could use your iPhone. All of, all of those things have an effect and we're all linked together uh, in this uh, uh, wonderful small planet in a sea of galaxies. And so it's just important for us to, to think. And I lastly wanted to think there is a rich, rich tradition, a really rich tradition of African-Americans thinking about democracy because democratic freedoms uh, were denied my ancestors um, in Louisiana. Uh, my ancestors come from the state of Louisiana via elsewhere, um, from Maryland, from Virginia, so down the river, as they said. Uh, and as I studied that history, um, as I uh, thought about family, those denials of uh, democratic freedoms make you think about them more and what they mean, not just for you, but for, for other people. Uh, so I was, uh, nine years old when uh, the Voting Rights Act came down, which meant that I saw my grandparents uh, get the right to participate as civic citizens for the first time. Um, so for me, there's a whole tradition of African-Americans thinking about questions of democracy, whether you're thinking about Frederick Douglass saying, what to a slave is the 4th of July, or whether you're thinking about Sojourner Truth, Oh, whether you're thinking about Ida B. Wells, people have been thinking among Black people themselves about what this actually means uh, for all of us. And as a result of the civil rights movement then, we have tried to expand uh, democratic freedoms uh, for uh, all kinds of uh, uh, minorities. And that is where we are faced today. Uh, and it really will require us to have discipline uh, cells as we take on the challenges of, of the retrenchment of democratic freedoms. And I believe democratic freedoms are being retrenched uh, for, uh, in, a, in, in a power grab. Uh, but we will have to figure out ways to converse and even converse with people we fundamentally and, and maybe strongly disagree with. And so this is, this is the, 
this is our moment. And so I started writing this book uh, back in, uh, back at really in uh, 20, uh, 2017, largely after Donald uh, Trump was inaugurated. I was invited to Elmhurst University, uh, once Elmhurst College in Illinois to give the Martin Luther King address. And I wrote one of these letters as my address to the students and they, you know, they kind of dug it. And so I said, well, you know, they liked it, uh, I'll go with it some more. So my whole process is, uh, is, to, is, is to think about, uh, uh, you know, writing uh, and, and how to put it in language uh, that uh, uh, people who at least uh, have some education and could, could, can read and, and to engage in. So that was my process. And this is what I've been thinking about. And what I really wanted to have been, been so excited to do is that I've been able to have conversations with a variety of audiences, with poets and writers and journalists and, and preachers and theologians and philosophers uh, and historians uh, to talk about the, the, these series of meditations. And so uh, I come to uh, uh, Fifth Avenue with, with that in mind. And lastly, I want to say something about your former uh, emeritus, uh, associate emeritus professor, uh, uh, Dr. McLeod. Uh, I met Dr. McLeod when I was, a, I studied theology at McCormick Theological Seminary. Uh, it seems like ages ago. Um, I uh, served uh, as a church pastor uh, from uh, 1984 to 1990 when I returned to back to graduate school to do PhD work. And, um, and uh, Oscar McLeod has been a deep influence on me. Uh, first of all, um, uh, he, he probably doesn't remember, but the denomination uh, gave me money to go to Eastern Europe, uh, to Romania and Hungary with one of my professors, uh, a man by the name of Bruce, Bruce Rigdon, uh, when it was still communist and run by Ceausescu and, and Hungary was thought about uh, as the miracle of the old uh, Soviet bloc. And, um, and I studied church life, uh, both the reformed church and the Orthodox church in Romania and Hungary back in 1980. Uh, and then um, I was lucky enough again to appeal to the church to do the same thing uh, in the Middle East, from Egypt to Dema uh, from Cairo to Damascus, and uh, to uh, the, the the West Bank and Palestine and Israel. So uh, it was a, a great theological education to get uh, a broad education about the world. And then I sat with uh, Dr. McLeod for a month, as I was the in and a couple of other people. We were youth delegates to the uh, World Council of Churches Assembly in 1983 in, in Vancouver, Canada. And uh, so I, I, I got to know Dr. McLeod pretty well in, in, in those years. Although I moved my own uh, ministry toward writing and intellectual endeavors um, uh, in terms of the academy, uh, nevertheless, I am eternally grateful uh, for his influence, uh, for uh, uh, what he did for the denomination. And I thank him and I thank you at Fifth Avenue. I don't want to belabor this. Uh, what I'd like, love to do if people have had a chance, some people have had a chance to get, get the book is to just to talk about it. And uh, so I, I will you know, entertain any questions from you, Jane that you might have as you, you engage the book. Yeah, thank you so much for that, um, that introduction. That was incredibly helpful. I, I thought it was so interesting. And, and you mentioned that your ministry hasn't necessarily been in, in churches, that it's been in academia. Um, but you mentioned in your book that you felt that connection to Dr. King through um, talking about faith and your own upbringing. Um, yes, yes. Can you explain a little bit about, about what you meant there? Yes, well, so I, I grew up in the city of New Orleans, um, 
And uh, where I lived in New Orleans, uh, I lived at the, the intersection of the Central Business District and the Garden District, uh, uh, two blocks away from St. Charles Avenue. And I grew up a Lutheran and I thought all Lutherans were black uh, because my church was all black, people all black. And we were the conservative branch of the Lutheran church. Uh, so we had the school. So we were in Missouri. The church is no longer a part of the Missouri Synod uh, Church. Uh, it is now part of the greater ELCA, uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. But at that time, it was still a Missouri Synod Church. And there were five other all black Missouri Synod Lutheran churches with schools. Uh, and everybody who was Lutheran looked like me. In fact, I came home, I think I was five or six and I asked my mother, did Dr. King found our church? Cause it was Martin Luther. And I was thought, well, maybe he founded our, our church. But what was also interesting about my neighborhood was that uh, around the corner from my neighborhood was a synagogue. So I knew people who were Jewish, my neighbors were Catholic. Uh, and so I lived in this eclectic neighborhood of blacks, Italians, Jews, in the city of New Orleans. New Orleans is like kind of uh, many different ways, of, but like New York in the sense of, because it's a port city and lots of immigrants. And so learning about the differences and the hierarchies of, of people was uh, uh, very important to me. So I grew up in, in that environment and thought, of, thought a great deal about uh, uh, people. And in, in my neighborhood, um, Actually, Dr. King with uh, a man named Abraham Lincoln uh, Davis, A.L. Davis, Reverend A.L. Davis, helped to found the Southern Le Christian Leadership uh, Conference. So I, I was surrounded by this stuff. So there was in the air um, uh, dialogue with the different kinds of people, all kinds of people who uh, are faith or no faith. Uh, and so, so, so when I was thinking about these, this, this issue that, that, that became the backdrop for me. And I wanted to tell a story in the book about uh, the, when Dr. King was assassinated, what that meant for the people that were um, teaching me and mentoring me and so forth. Uh, one, one of the things that I love about the book is that it is letters. Um, so, you know, you start each chapter with Dear Martin um, is it dear, dear, dear Martin? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you start each chapter with dear Martin, which is, you know, it's personal. Yes. What, what, um, why did you take this format? Oh, I think because what I've learned from teaching, I'm teaching a whole new generation of students, right? And personal is something they, they get, they get into. Um, uh, in, in my day, things were objective, far away, and students uh, are real, you know, uh, more, you know, my parents were born in the Great Depression, so they had no feelings. <laughs> and they had no feelings. <laughs> you know, oh, of course, they had feelings, of course, but they thought that didn't matter. You, 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 tough, you tough life out. I mean, that's what I mean by no feelings. Yes. <laughs> you, you just tough life out, okay? That, that, we don't have time for this. Life is tough, you tough it out. Well, I have students who are much more sensitive and other things. And I thought, okay, if they're gonna read something like this, or I'm gonna talk about it, they need to have that inner connection with it. And as I said in, in, in the earlier talk, that both I found the kind of appeal of, if you ever read the novel, The Color Purple by Alice Walker, or my friend Tyree Jones's American Marriage, You'll, you'll get the sense of that the letters really work as a literary form uh, for to get people to, to embrace and think about uh, issues because it's, they're intimate. So you're drawn in, right? A letter, letter draws you in and uh, uh, just like a, a diary entry might, you know, like you get, you, you get the sense of knowing the person. Mm. You, there's, so many of Dr. King's write, own writings to draw on. You you used you know you used bits and pieces throughout um, several uh, several of the chapters. What which um, which of his works 
do you feel like you drew on the most or that you connected with the most in this? Well, you know, uh, that's an interesting question. I actually uh, started studying Dr. King as a university student. Uh, uh, I went to the University of Michigan. So there are a lot of New Yorkers who went to Michigan. So, you know, go blue if you're out in the audience, go blue. Uh, uh, and so uh, there was a professor uh, that I took a seminar with uh, named Harold Cruz, who's a famous uh, uh, in African American studies, Black studies. Uh, and his, he had written a book uh, called The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. And I'd taken a seminar on civil rights with him. And I decided that at that time in the 70s, when I was in college, that I would um, write this paper on the intellectual sources of Martin Luther King Jr. Well, at the time, uh, most of the books that were written then in the early 70s about King were more attributing the sources to, uh, to uh, people who were the traditional theologians Reinhold Niebuhr, other kinds of people. And, and, you know, so I wrote that paper thinking crap, I'd never come back to that, that, that subject again. Um, and then I um, decided to do a PhD in history. And I took up the subject of, one of the uh, subjects I took up was uh, King's mentor. Who mentored King? A man named Benjamin Mays who was the president of Morehouse College, who was a theologian, a PhD from the University of Chicago Divinity School. And so I wrote a book that was published in 2012 on, on Mays, uh, his mentor, because uh, that's, I, you have to figure out where did King learn about Gandhi? Uh, where did King learn about all of these things? So when that book was published and, and, and I'm, really grateful, it, it won book awards and other stuff like that uh, on Mays, um, it, it sort of opened up the floodgates. Well, I was going on to other subjects that I wanted to, to write about, uh, uh, but I came back, back, uh, back around to thinking about this book on King because I think King still speaks to the time. Um, King is not the only civil rights leader um, and he always said that, um, and you know, on Martin Luther King Day, he he would say that this would be a time to welcome all civil rights leaders, and um, uh, and he was a man of his time. He's born in 1929. My dad was born 1930. Uh, uh, men of those times were pretty sexist, let me say. Uh, the, they um, um, uh, so I, I want to sort of not worship King, but uh, to use him as a, a, a foil or a, a, think, a think against uh, peace uh, to ask questions of, uh, to um, look at. And in terms of his own work, I think the most influential work when I was a student uh, that I had read was uh, The Strength to Love, uh, a series of sermons that he had written uh, about, uh, about love. And that's what I take up uh, I take up one chapter uh, on that. But uh, in terms of, I actually find the outtakes of King, what I mean by that, all those things are in his archive, the letters, his own letters, his own responses to certain things, fascinating uh, and interesting. And Stanford University has simply done uh, a wonderful job under uh, formerly their former director, Claiborne Carson, of putting those uh, up online for people to read. So there are things that you can go into that database and it's open to the public uh, and really read letters uh, that the King, that people probably don't know. And so, uh, uh, and then I found a set of, um, uh, through a, fr a friend, Michael Honey, who's a labor historian, these wonderful talks about labor uh, by Dr. King. Um, about what it meant to go to work and for, not for us who are in making lots of money, but for people who are in the struggle and why they need protections and why they need better wages and so forth and so on. And, and the threat to those in, in, in terms of automation and so forth. 
I know this is, um, oh, well, first, real quick, um, folks at, at home, I want to invite you um, to also uh, begin to ask any questions that you have. You can use the Q&A button that is at the bottom of your screen. If you hover over, you'll see some some uh, tabs there. You can click on the Q&A, and if, if you can't find it, just go ahead and type your question in the chat, and I will go ahead and read those out to Dr. Jelks uh, as we continue. Um, and, and I, I, I know this is a the, the premise of the whole book, um, but what, how do you see uh, Dr. King's work, um, and maybe just a snippet, uh, speaking to us directly today with all of the things that are going on in our in our world and country? Well, today? I, I actually think I think the it, um, the speech beyond Vietnam is the thing that you, we all should read and think about. People take a uh, take snippets out of it. It's you know the, it's time to end the silence, but I think we should read that uh, because I think King is deeply anticipating uh, uh, the shift that is going on in the United States. He he, he would say privately uh, that he sometimes thought his dream was going to turn into a nightmare, uh, and so I think it's important that we look back. Uh, uh, as one source, not the only source, uh, as one source of trying to think about the the the, the greater greater picture. So I would point you to to, to beyond Vietnam as a way. It's because that's the that speech was given on April fourth, nineteen sixty seven. He died on April fourth, nineteen sixty eight. One year later, and so I I think that 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 is a uh, sort of an eerie uh, response about the, the shift in government and what would government mean uh, for all of us uh, and so forth. And the questions of violence. I mean, we, we talk about the questions of violence. He said, you know, what, what can I tell young people on the street about violence if my own government is being the greatest purveyor of violence? Uh, so these are the kinds of ways we have to think about uh, King, he's really anticipating the, the kind of democratic um, turn we're making in, in, in the country today. Hmm. Yeah, I did, I did notice and I, did, I hadn't known this before until I was um, reading the book and then when you and I were speaking just before we began, um, this the Beyond Vietnam speech was at Riverside Church in April of 1967, and you just preached in April at Riverside. Was it April at Riverside? Church? Yeah, it was. So it was April. Is... <laughs> yeah, like April second. Yeah, that's great. That is a very yeah. fun connection that you right. have uh, yeah, to that right, right. for Riverside Church in New York. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> well, I, you know, I mean, and of course, King had spoken at Riverside before, um, and um, the interim uh, uh, pastor at Riverside said, "Oh, well, you should come on." On that day, it was re really great. It was great. It was wonderful. That is very fun. Uh, folks, you are welcome to join join me in asking questions. I don't want to be hogging the entire uh, time. And I think that they don't necessarily need to be about um, the book it, per se. Uh, I know some of you, uh, many of you probably haven't had a chance to, to read it, but I know that um, Dr. Jelks, just in his wealth of knowledge about um, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It, this um, it, it was it was so much it was so it was so great to read the book and just feel like there was so much content that was yours and also so much that was just connected to real letters that he had written or real parts of speeches that uh, that he had spoken. Oh. And it was just really helpful to see yeah. um, you know even just those those right those writings by him. Right. Well, I you know I would. I, I think people pigeonhole all, all people, first of all, but I think they pigeonhole historic figures because the only thing you know about King is I have a dream. And you know, the, the first time he spoke at the Washington, um, uh, I mean, the Lincoln Memorial was May 17th, uh, 1957. And he gives a speech, give us the ballot. Uh, and he's calling for voter voting rights act. Um, that won't happen until 1965, uh, but he's calling that that what people need is access so they they, they can choose their own 
democratic represent, re, repre, representation. Uh, and we are still fighting about give us the ballot, right? Who controls the ballot? Uh, who controls power in, in the United States? So I, I wanted people to sort of broaden the scope. I wanted them to know that uh, uh, the, the worries he had about automation, what will that mean for work for ordinary people? I mean, yes, we all have engineers, we all have tech people, um, but what does a society look like without people who discipline themselves around work? Now, sometimes disciplining yourself around work is a wholly negative thing, right? Because work, if you're a sharecropper or, 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 or peasant, you're disciplining yourself around a form of work that kind of robs you of your dignity. Um, if you're an underpaid worker, uh, as we night precisely in, in the essential workers um, or a fast food worker, uh, you nobody's thinking about you. Uh, but I wanted you know to think about all these questions that he thought about that are hitting us every day, uh, all the time in in, in the newspaper. Yeah. Or people still read the newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> people still read the newspapers. Uh, I think they read it online. At least I do. Yeah. We had, we get our news online still. It's not like we stopped. Yeah. Um, I we do have a couple of questions. Uh Jayma has asked, um, could you read one of the passages from your book that speaks most sure. to you today? Of course. Just one second. Okay. <laughs> I love that background picture. Well, thanks folks for joining me and asking some questions. Even if you haven't read the book, I think that um, there's so much to glean from um, King's life uh, and um, Dr. Jelks has, has studied him and researched him for so long that this is a great chance to ask some questions about these these letters. I'm going to do one quick thing because I think my wife moved my book. <laughs> it was sitting here with this, this uh, the clean the clean cleanup person. <laughs> one second, I will just pull it off my computer here. While Dr. Jux is looking, uh, feel free to continue uh, asking questions in the Q&A or in the chat. You're welcome to do that. I will be with you one second. <laughs> no worries, no worries. It's a disappearing book here. <laughs> I had to make sure earlier that I had my copy. I, I almost left it at church, but I brought it home with me. I was telling uh, Dr. Jux earlier while we were getting ready that it is hard to find uh, time to read books. <laughs> and so I just fortunately had a quick weekend vacation where I was able to sit by a lake. And so that was how I was able to, uh, to have, have some time to, to finish letters to Martin. So that was a great, great time there. Oh, here it is. All right. All right. Thank you for your patience. I want to read from a chapter called, uh, it's the opening of a chapter called Network of 
mutuality. So um, in this uh, the chapter, I, I begin all my chapters with uh, songs from, um, and this is, uh, begins the chapter network of mutuality begins with Harold Melvin in the blue notes. And it says, wake up everybody, no more sleeping in bed, no more backwards thinking time for thinking ahead. And, and then I begin, uh, Martin, I've read some of your closest peers call you Martin and others called you Mike. I thought of you as Martin after seeing your photograph in John Williams' book, The King That God Didn't Save When I Was 13. There was only you and Andrew Young in the Birmingham airport around 4 a.m. in the morning. You were slumped over with a cigarette in your hand, exhausted. You were weary like the men who labored in my childhood neighborhood of New Orleans, drooped over after a week's work of physical toil from jobs that paid too little. They were like you trying to preserve enough energy to enjoy families and friends. They too slumped over in bar rooms and on their front porches with a cigarette and a beer fatigue. The photograph reminded me of Southern black and white men known only by their initials, not their full names. To me, you were not Mike, your former birth name and nickname. That name bore a childhood familiarity I dared not broach. In my eyes, you were Martin in the same way they were EJs and ABs throughout the South. At 13 years of age, that photograph offered me a lesson in your humanity. You are not the icon of every new magazine of legend. You are an exhausted worker. That photograph was not Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. It was Martin, the overworked laborer. The toil of your labor had taken it out of you. As exhausted as you appeared to be in that photo, there was still something beautiful about it. You were James Brown short, meaning in height. You looked like the dark skinned men in my communities that I saw at the barbershop and in church and on the street corners. And you held the same blank handsomeness that US society so fears. This is something men in our community loved about you secretly, even if they disagreed with you on questions of self defense. You were dark as they were, short with a wide black African nose, and you had hair that you brushed to smooth out the naps of your hair. Further, you shared black hilarity. Behind closed doors, you exhibited stylistically the irreverent rival humor that I heard from men on my streets and from my uncles. You were filled with off-color remarks, wisecracks on topics from politics to sex. And though you looked dog tired, I wondered what you told Andrew Young as the two of you waited for the airplane back to Atlanta. I am certain that even in your weariness, there was a funny exchange about the dire situation the movement faced. You had to laugh to keep from crying. The fact is that your constant toiling on the road took you away from home too much. You spent nearly all your adult life on the road organizing to build a democratic society this was your zeitgeist, the spirit of the time. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Eric who asks, who says, I haven't had a chance to read your book, but what would you imagine King would say in response to your letters to him? Oh, I think he would enjoy it. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, he would have enjoyed the intellectual ra uh, repartee. Uh, he would have, uh, I, I, I would have hoped he would have wrote me a series of thoughtful responses back. Uh, uh, but I do think, I mean, he was a, he was a man of letters and he, he thought about these questions deeply. And, um, I, you know, uh, one thing I, wish he would have had it was more time to think and write it himself, but he was always on the road. But I think he would have wrote me back because he did write letters back to people, not just the letters to Birmingham jail, but people when he had time 
uh, to sit down and pin letters back to people. And what do we say? Um, I hope you said I was right about lots of things. <laughs> oh, um, Virginia asks, do you think that we are going back to Jim Crow in terms of voter suppression? I think voter suppression, no. I think voter suppression is all is suppression of, 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 of a great minority, a great majority of people. I mean, uh, the difference is that Jim Crow was to eliminate black voting in the South. If, if you, after the Civil War, black people made up 50% of Louisiana. So if 50% of them would have voted, uh, that would have changed the, the, the political, who was in political leadership, uh, would change the nature of the political economy uh, in the state of Louisiana, South Carolina, Mississippi, uh, so the, the kind of violent repression that was put down against voting, uh, specifically in the, the, the American South, uh, is being exercised, but at a different level. I mean, after all, Clarence Thomas, um, uh, Justice Thomas, a, a Black Georgian, is on the Supreme Court and um, a, a, a conservative member. So I don't think in the kind of racialized sense, we're going back to Jim Crow but in the sense of, of a small uh, elite minority, an oligarchy uh, trying to control uh, governance in the United States. I do believe that is what the attempt is. Thank you. Chris asks um, or says, I am the co-host and moderator of the Episcopal, Episcopal Actors Guild in New York City. Sustainable conversations is our next, oh, sustainable, hmm, sustainable conversations. Our next topic is separate but equal versus integration. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I, well, I uh, just finished a review essay for the Los Angeles Review of Books. And um, uh, of course, African Americans uh, at the time of Brown v. Board of Education were mixed feelings about this because um, as I said, I grew up in New Orleans, I had all black teachers. Um, and the, the, the greatest people hurt by the Brown versus Board of Education were black teachers who were no longer added to uh, the roles of schools in the South. So many black teachers got uh, got laid off. Uh, that that's that's that that was the um, that was the uh, you know troubling side of Brown v. Board. The upside of Brown v. Board was ending Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, which was um, the case again. Another New Orleans person, um, Homer Plessy, um, you know um, uh, who who just got exonerated this past January uh, in the city of New Orleans. It was a big, a big celebration there. Um, the you know, Plessy versus Ferguson enshrined that the South could have separate quote unquote, but equal laws. Uh, of course, uh, we, you, you know, that was never going to be equal. And again, with the large black population, uh, in the South, uh, it was a way to keep a cheap labor force throughout the South. So uh, uh, we we all have to think think about that. Uh, you know, our, our, our buzzword in academics and in some some businesses uh, is uh, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but I don't see that much as uh, being uh, giving communities power. Uh, to run their own lives and, and, and to make decisions for themselves. Uh, I see that as a set of elite people uh, getting jobs uh, in a particular uh, setting. Uh, and most companies do that as window dressing, not as real policy, uh, because that's the, the, the bottom line. Uh, and so uh, inclusivity, 
uh, means that a group of people can come to the table and be heard and exercise power just like any other group of, of people. Uh, that's where we, we want to go. So I, I always, this is why I use the term democratic inclusion. We want to include all people and communities, uh, not just uh, not just lone individuals, but also communities. I hope that I didn't ramble too much. Nope, not at all. So in the in the university setting, you're working with with young people. Um, what would you say, what what do you hope you what do you hope the next generation, the young people um, can get from from this book and from looking at uh, King's work as it is for them today? Well, you know, I'm luckily enough, uh, both for my graduate students and for undergraduates, I've been able to teach a couple of courses around the topic uh, and give them readings and uh, make, make discoveries for themselves um, and make challenges uh, for, uh, for, for themselves. So it's, it's, it's important that we give uh, critical thinking uh, skills to young young people. Uh, I don't try to, I tell them this is my informed viewpoint from my perspective. You have to decide what you think it is that you want. So to recognize that I'm trying to give them uh, dignity and um, it, 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 my job is to teach them uh, to think uh, critically and but be respectful of each other, you know. Um, what we do is it tend to, even in colleges and high school, is to swing ideological ax hammers at each other. Uh, and that's, 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 that's the problem because we don't define our terms. Sometimes even in academics, people don't define their terms very well. And so you ask them a question, well, you know, what does this mean? What does that mean? And everybody gets on the defensive and I try not to have them on the defensive. Uh, so I'm trying to get young people to think. And the first place you should think is at the local level. So I'm a good Presbyterian. And so in the Presbyterian doctrine, all everything begins at the local church and moves up on down the line. So these questions that come before us begin at the local church level. Even if we're going to disagree, they still begin at the local church level. So I, the, the question of sustainability begins with, well, you know, New York City has over 120 year old piping down there. What are we gonna do about that for clean water? It's not just Flint, Michigan that we have to worry about. It's, it's the country about it. And it begins at the local level. So what are the questions you're gonna ask Eric Adams as what are you going to ask the mayor of Kansas City uh, about those kinds of questions? And I try to get students to think that it's, uh, we always are thinking about these big national questions. But first we begin with the local, local, local level. Do you know who your dog catcher is? <laughs> and uh, do you know, you know, uh, in your city, if there's a drain commissioner, uh, all of those kinds of, of things uh, are, are really important. So at the local level, at the presbytery, at the, at the session, uh, that's where we begin. That is very Presbyterian of you. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I, de definitely, de you know, this is where I learned my politics 101. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I was. I do love when I teach a confirmation class, which I haven't done in quite a while. But I love when I explain it that you know the Presbyterian government is very similar to that of the United States. That's correct. <laughs> we run very similarly. That's correct. The Book of Order is a law book. Absolutely. Yep. Um. In one of your uh, in one of your chapters, a stone of hope. Um. You you talk about um or you mentioned that he um, translated Hebrews 11.1, 1, which reads, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And King, you said, 
King translates it with powerful conviction. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. This is the foundation of democracy. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about what that, what that means? Yes, uh, I think that we, when I read the, the headlines, uh, people are all despairing and there is despair all around. And there are despairing situations, but you can't approach them with despair. Uh, you have to approach them hope. Now hope is not optimism. And I, I wanna make a distinction there. Hope is something long-term. Am I, am I pessimistic about the short-term? Absolutely. But I, but I am hopeful for the long-term that, that people will continue to organize and will continue to come around and uh, see the point, uh, see the, uh, see the point, uh, a different kind of point of view. That it is really responsible of us to build sustainable ways of living now. It's really, mm. uh, but that's going to be a long term struggle because we're fighting against greed. Uh, and we're fighting, and we don't, you know, I mean, in, it's, it's out of fashion now to use the word sin, but essentially greed is sin. I mean, that's what the, it is about the self over, in, over and self wealth over against any other kind of interest. Absolutely. So hope is the long-term conviction. Not, now I'm not, you know, in the short term, uh, you know, you know, I'm, uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's quite troubling. What I rely on, and this is why I said this book comes out of a, a African-American experience, that 100 years ago, we wouldn't be talking about Kamala Harris. Uh, we wouldn't talk about uh, uh, any number of people who, who, black women who are mayors of cities. So hope is there. Now, what we have to fight against is that all people have greed or compromise or whatever, or corruption. That's a human trait, period. And so we have to continue to organize in goodwill with other people of goodwill to keep everybody on task. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I'll, I'll tell you the story. I, I, I uh, worked on the first uh, campaign for a uh, black mayor of Chicago uh, in, in 1982-83, Harold Washington. And at the end of the campaign, when he had won, we finally had secured victory. He called all the campaign volunteers uh, to the to gather, and he gave us a talk. He said, look, I'm the mayor of Chicago now, and I'm the mayor of the whole city. And I've got business interests, I've got this interest, so you all have to stay organized and keep me honest. And th th that was a recognition that as the mayor, he's got a lot of powerful groups all over the place pulling on him. And he said, look, if I can tell the business community, I got 10,000 people outside my office saying, no, we want this, then I got leverage with them. Uh, so, so we have to keep them, them honest. And nobody wants to be kept honest. I mean, corporations don't want to, uh, politicians don't want to, even us in our own personal dealings, don't want to. So, but we all have to have some system to keep us honest. And I'm hoping that that's where the hope lies, mm -hmm. uh, that we continue to seek and make people accountable for their actions. Mm. Absolutely. Well, if there aren't any other questions, um, Dr. Jux, I'll ask you in a moment for any final thoughts, but um, I just, I really have appreciated um, this book. I think it, uh, for me, it, it really just brought, you know, I, I read, when I read Dr. King's works, I often, I don't often um, have the, the words to put it into today's issues or to update in my mind how this relates. And this really was helpful to, to really look at 
things, you know, climate change, you mentioned climate change and what might that have, you know, what might he have said about climate change, um, e even the pandemic and kind of, you know, uh, up to date things and, and how um, Dr. King may have may have explored those issues. So thank you so much for this. Um, do you have any final thoughts to share with us before we yes, start? I, I think one of the, the thing that I want you to get at is um, we should all hate injustice, but we should not hate one another. Mm -hmm. uh, we are all frail, all of us. Uh, all of us have a shelf life. Uh, and uh, so we should hate what we think are the injustices, and we should speak to people with the kind of great, with great dignity uh, that um, we want to be spoken to. If that's anything you can take away uh, from uh, reading this book. And I also hope that it gives you opportunity to find some hope. That's why I wrote it. Uh, that. I, I don't want to be like the news cycle. I mean, the news cycle begins with, oh, this horrible thing happened today. When we also know that there are millions of wonderful self-giving things that happen the same day, but that doesn't sell. And I'm trying to sell a, a sort of new drug so we can we can go forward uh, and, and, and build. And that's that's hope. Uh, and that's what we need to be doing to, uh, today. No movement begins without aspirational goals, you know, and so we have to define aspirational goals. What does it mean to be inclusive uh, in all, all of our talk um, and, uh, and, and, and how we respect one another is really, really important. Yeah. Well, thank you. This has been very hope hope filled, and <laughs> the book did give me hope. So, thank you so much um, for this, uh, and thanks, folks at home, for joining us this evening and for your um, questions. Uh, I really appreciated uh, folks jumping in with some good questions. So, thank you all, and particularly thank you, Dr. Jelks, for joining us this evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you all, and invite me to fifth to preach. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Have a good night. Alrighty. Bye-bye now. Bye.